Hey, Katie. Hey, Katie. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Good. I'm so sorry. I'm like simultaneously eating, eating dinner. So I'm going <laughs> to turning my camera on. I'm like on the move. <laughs> no problem. No problem at all. So it's just going to be you, me, and Audra, who is a former president actually of the Junior League of Boston. Okay. So I think it'll be a good group. And I'm hoping we will record so we'll be able to send it out. So I'm okay. kind of thinking of us as like podcast hosts since not a lot of people signed up for tonight. I mean, I think that's probably the case. Um, I mean, there's since there was another one too. Yeah. Hi. I can't, I think you're on mute. Let me see if I can. I might be able to unmute you myself. No, I can't. Let's see. How's that? Perfect. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, I was renaming myself. I was doing two things at once. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. No problem. Um, uh, my name's Caitlin. Nice to meet you. Thanks for joining us tonight. Thank you. It's nice to be invited. Yes, absolutely. Hopefully this is going to be an intimate group. It's We've got one more joining us, so we'll have an intimate talk, but we're excited if you're open to recording it. Sure. Yeah, that we can, and maybe we can, um, we have, this is called the salon series, which is very intimate groups. And then we do bigger trainings with like 50, 60 people. Um, so we can always kind of think about maybe doing that, um, particularly for your, uh, your full-time job, the Metro housing. I think that would be so great for us to learn more about that. Sure. Well, we can talk about whatever you want to talk about tonight. Great. That's great. And I think we've done a few of these now. Um, this is, I think our fourth or fifth of the month. So we have found that like 45 minutes to an hour is kind of the perfect timing. Most um, people are zoomed out by this time of the day. <laughs> I know it's so true. It's so Our true. attention spans get shorter and shorter the more we're on Zoom. Exactly. And exactly. Some days I have like three meetings in a row, and I'm like, oh. I know. I know. It really is crazy. I. But you know, it's so great too because we have the opportunity to kind of fit in time. With you know, we usually we'd have these events at people's homes or at our headquarters. We have a headquarters on Newbury Street. Um. So a lot of times we would have trainings there and it, it was having to get there was always kind of hard for people too. So yeah. logging on is so easy. It's kind of great in that sense. Yeah. Good. So have, is it increased participation? It really has Good. significantly. I found that with um, doing political work with running phone banks on Zoom. Yeah. Um, I was, you know, I did it for we're not being recorded yet, right? I did it for um, <laughs> Maine Democratic Party, and then I did it for okay. Swing Left. So, uh, and I had people from all over the country show up. Wow. And, um, you know, it, it was great. You know, you, you have, you, usually, you know, you have, you know, five or six, maybe 10 people at a phone bank. Here you could get like 40 people show up and you train them all and you sit there wow. on Zoom if they have questions. It was great. It really is pretty amazing. Yeah, yeah. So even, I mean, I think we had one event where we had like over a hundred people sign up for training. We've never, you know, our room wouldn't even be able to handle more than 20. So yeah. it's, it's very cool. All right, I'm just getting my little ducks in a row here. Sure. We get started, and we have Katie on the line as well. Um, she's joining us. Hi, Anna, nice to meet you. Hi, Katie. How are you? Thank you. I'm also on the training council with with Caitlin. Yeah, so we we're all a full volunteer organization, um, and we all have placements. So we all work for you know the Junior League of of Boston as a volunteer aspect as well. So what we do is part of the training. 
Yeah, so our, our council, um, particularly for the salon series, which, you know, we're doing now, which is this more intimate, um, you know, more intimate kind of discussion, we put this on, but then um, our council that Caitlin's the VP of, um, we also put on like those larger ones she was alluding to, so. Great. Yeah. I forgot to mention too, I'm a fellow Eagle. Oh, great. <laughs> <laughs> So I, that's how I came to Boston. Bad press this week for Boston College uh, around. Well, I haven't the, even seen it. I haven't even looked at the news. Uh, around the, the treating of, of black students. So um, not, not addressing issues, uh, pe people feeling unsafe. Yeah. So that's really, yeah, I, I'm glad that there is a platform for people to be able to kind of voice concerns that maybe they wouldn't have felt like they could in the past. And I hope that BC handles that appropriately. I do too. Um. I think it's hard, you know, even, you know, the Junior League of Boston, we've really come, you know, our, our ability to understand the importance of diversity, equity, inclusion, and really our, the importance of you know, not just saying those words, but also thinking about things like the white savior complex and how we run our nonprofit work and what that means. And are, are we really helping how, you know, how, are we learning about the computer communities that we're working with that we're trying to, are we serving them? Or are we empowering them? You know, all these things, all these conversations have been so critical this year. And I hope, and I know with the Junior League of Boston, that it's really going to change the fabric of what we do for better. And and how we interact with the city of Boston. And I mean, I hope BC can do that too, because I feel like they really sit on the, the other end of that sometimes. Yes, it's, um, every, everybody has a long way to go when it comes to doing this work. Um, you know, yeah. it, even if you have a diverse workforce, you're not ex you're not doing the rest of it. Usually, it's you know it's a three step process. So, diversity people stop at diversity and think, oh wow, that's it. But yeah, it's it's so true. It's so true. Um, and it it's it's like a mammoth too. You know, I mean, you really have to kind of think about everything you do differently in in a lot of ways. Um, but there's so much to be gained through that. I think people don't realize how much we're all missing out on if we don't embrace that. Mm -hmm. Everybody suffers. Um, yep. Yeah. All right. So we should have Audra joining us here. She's actually a former president of the Junior League of Boston. She'll be joining us soon. Are you from Boston? So um, I grew up in Newton. Okay. And uh, I've lived in Boston since 1996. Lived in Cambridge for a little bit. Um, and then Boston. Got it. It is quite the winter we're having. <laughs> I'm from California. So <laughs> I didn't well, know that, Caitlin. I, I am as well. Are you really, Katie? Where are you from in California? Um, the Bay Area, Palo Alto. Oh, I'm from Los Gatos. Oh my goodness. No way. <laughs> yeah. That's too weird. Yeah, I went to um to Sacred Heart, like growing up. Oh. With it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I went to um uh presentation high school. Yeah. Right. St. Andrews Episcopal School. Cool. So that's and so funny. Oh. Yeah, and Delaney uh, is Delaney and Sam are both from uh, Los Angeles, so also. I think I knew. I definitely knew that about Sam. That's so weird. We have a lot of Californians. I think we need to start a club. Yeah, I mean, I think Junior League. Um, you know, and jun like I'm. I'm sure you're. You've kind of read up on the Junior League since being invited to do this. Um, but I do think we attract like a lot of transplants, um, you know, since like Boston definitely has like a very like good network of young professionals. Um, 
who aren't from here and are seeking to meet other other like-minded women. So that doesn't <laughs> doesn't surprise me <laughs> that we have a lot of a lot of Californians. Yeah, absolutely. It's a it's a great way to to sort of find your community, um, especially if you're coming from someplace else. And in Boston is not the most friendliest place sometimes. Correct. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunate. I know. We actually we had um, Ayana Polk from the Women's Advancement Office come in and talk to us. She's from New Jersey and was kind of talking about that element of moving to Boston. Part of me hopes, kind of thinks maybe it'll go away a little. Like it's kind of starting to fade. There's enough transplants now, almost that it feels like I don't know, kind of starting to go away. Well, I think the city has really grown and changed, um, and for the better. Um, yeah. In in sort of when you look at you know how things change over time in leaps and bounds, uh, you know, to go from you know electing Ayanna Presley to city council as the first African American woman, and then you know ten years later electing her as the first. Uh, African-American woman of Congress for the state of Massachusetts, you can see the trajectory of how it's become a much more inclusive and open city. Absolutely, it's so true. I've been, I've been here since 2007. Um, so, you know, kind of seen a decade and a little more of, of Boston. And I feel like even, you know, since, since I got here, how much it's changed, I feel like is, is amazing. Yeah. And even, you know, the institutions that we participate in, particularly like the Junior League of Boston, I've been in, a member of the Junior League of Boston for a decade. Um, and it was a, you know, it's a Boston institution. It's been around since 1907, I think. That's why it's on Newbury Street. It could afford to be. <laughs> we could afford to be on Newbury Street in 1930, whatever, when we bought it. <laughs> uh, so that is definitely um, seeing the, how the Junior League has changed reflects how the city has changed. It's really fascinating um, and wonderful in a lot of ways. I'm going to give it one more minute and then we can start things up um at 6 35 and i'm really going to kind of think of this as a podcast katie oh here we've got audra um hello how are you good sorry i just ran in from work no no problem at all i was just saying we're going to kind of treat tonight a little bit like a podcast um so since we've got an intimate group tonight uh we're going to circulate this recording um once we kind of start which will you know be in a minute um with our member base so they can, you know, learn more and hear more. Uh, before we start, you know, Katie and I have introduced ourselves. So Audra, I know you just jumped on, but if you want to go ahead and introduce, introduce yourself as well, we would love that. Um, not sure what kind of introduction you're looking for. Um, oh, just Audra Day Norman. I been a member of the Junior League for, I don't know, many, many years, <laughs> um, since 2003, I think. Um, I'm very interested in nonprofit management, um, very interested in human rights. Perfect. <laughs> Great. Well, that's all we need for tonight, I think. Um, so once I introduce um, every, you know, we've, we've introduced everybody, we can just jump right in. Um, and if you want to just talk through your kind of history, how you got to where you are now, and then we can kind of open up for questions and we'll um, kind of think about 45 minutes to an hour um, of time tonight. Um, so, you know, if you have uh, more questions past the 45 minute mark, we'll just, I'll call it, I'll just let everybody know the timing at that point and then we can kind of go from there. Does that work for everybody? Sure. So um, I could start at the beginning. Um, <laughs> so I grew up working class in, in Newton um, and um, 
so uh, I, I, I'm of a certain age. So um, when I came out to my parents, I was actually thrown out of my house. So um, I went to BC um, the hard way. I went six years at night because um, most of the time I was working full time, did it at night, um, just trying to survive. So um, I um, had growing up in Newton, um, I had been sort of, I went to Newton North High School where they sort of put you in tracks and I was put in the business track instead of the college track. So I had um, two years of bookkeeping, which was the best experience that I ever had because uh, it allowed me to survive. It, it allowed me to get jobs. Uh, and so when, um, before I went to BC, I took, I went to, I took a couple of courses at Mass Bay Community College in accounting. Then I took like six courses at Bentley, but um, I didn't feel like that um, I was able to uh, be able to do full-time college work. I didn't have a lot of self-confidence. And I went to BC at night in Father Woods, and now it's the Woods School, was amazing. And he sat me down after I had had about six courses under my belt at BC and said, when are you gonna matriculate? So um, I matriculated, I graduated from BC um, in 1990. Uh, no one in my family had graduated from college or had ever owned their own house. Uh, the year I graduated from college, my younger sister graduated from medical school. So it was sort of a, it was sort of a big, big thing. Um, so, um, and so through, you know, after BC, I worked at uh, several places, always in the accounting field, um, worked, always worked my way up. Um, and um, I was working at a software management company as the general ledger accountant. Um, and I was a very good Catholic all my life. And after, while at BC and going to school at night, I, I decided to major in theology and I left BC a very good Protestant instead. <laughs> and I went off to seminary in what, um, got my master's in divinity. Um, at that time, I was uh, sojourning in the Episcopal church where they would not ordain me because I was a lesbian. So um, I um, went back to work in accounting and uh, nonprofit and housing, which I feel very strongly about. So um, now I live in JP with my wonderful wife, Nancy. Um, I was eventually ordained in uh, the United Church of Christ. And so working full time as a CFO, I was also a chaplain at um, a residential school in Arlington, which they called the Residential School for Troubled Girls, Jermaine Lawrence. But it wasn't for troubled girls, it was for troubled society because um, these girls were damaged by everything that was placed upon them. So um, I did that work for 13 years and loved it. Um, I started um, getting involved in politics and um, strongly, you know, I'd always been a good, good Dem. And, uh, but when Deval Patrick was running for governor the first time, so that's the first time I really got engaged in politics. I joined my local ward committee and became uh, co-chair of that in 2006. 2009, I was a group of progressive activists in Jamaica Plain that formed a little group called Jamaica Plain Progressives. And um, so we do a lot of work um, on forums and electing progressive candidates to office. Through that work is where I met Marty Walsh when he was running for mayor. Um, and I was very honored um, when in, 2019, he decided to uh, reestablish the Human Rights Commission, which was had been established in 1984, but then not active since 1996. So there had been a long time without a Human Rights Commission in the city of Boston. So I was appointed to the commission in December. Um, didn't really get up and running um, until June. So it's um, 
you know, in, in, in the midst of COVID, um, things became very difficult. So we had this sort of basically new commission that had all these powers. We could conduct hearings, we could call witnesses, we could issue reports, we could do investigations. But we would try to decide where our place was in the city because it the city had changed so, so much um, that there, there was now all these other really active and powerful, uh, you know, commissions doing work. So we, um, we talked about the areas that we really wanted to look at and in what we wanted to do. So, um, pardon me, I just want to look at some of my notes so I don't forget anything. So um, we, we decided to, uh, so we spent a lot of time talking about that, how we, how we would be a different version than we were in 1996. So we decided we were going to look at patterns and practice of human rights violations instead of just dealing with individual complaints like it had done previously. And so we, um, so all our meetings are, you know, public law, so all our meetings are open. So um, we had to decide where we fit in with the other departments in the city. So we, we had the city of Boston's uh, Fair Housing and Equity Commissioner come, the, uh, the head of the Department of Innovation and Technology, Age Strong, which used to be the Elders Commission. Um, we had people come, from uh, the mayor really wanted us to focus on immigration rights. So we had uh, people come from like Mira and the Brazilian Workers Center and talk to us about what was going on and where we could, we, where we could be needed. Um, so, you know, some of the concrete things we did was during the last election cycle, we, we sent a letter to the elections committee to request more early voting drop-off boxes in communities of color and immigrant communities. Um, we, we, you know, so we filed a motion on that. We, we followed very closely the work of the Boston Police Reform Task Force. We sent a letter to uh, then Police Commissioner Gross requesting a report because there were certain benchmarks that he should have been reporting back on and nobody was uh, charged with that at that time. So we asked him to report back to us on those and then he resigned. So we didn't get that report back, but we will, we will keep looking at that. Um, we hosted, uh, we decided to host a series of events. We had our first one in June, in, on January 14th, uh, at, that was entitled uh, Human Rights in the Black Male in America, because we wanted to bring awareness to the marginalization trauma in heal, necessary healing for black men in society. So we were gonna, that was first in a series that we wanted to look at how that impacts people. So we also, um, one of the issues that really came up to us was the, ex, the access to the internet and the inequalities. And um, we, we identified a need to study and resolve the issues of disparity uh, in the Boston neighborhoods, we we looked at a lot of data and how um, you know there there are you can see where neighborhoods in Boston where cable companies went in and they ignored those neighborhoods, you know the low low income community of color neighborhoods and you know with the pandemic it was obvious to everyone that kids were supposed to be learning remotely and they didn't even have internet access. So we brought in, you know, several people from several different departments, talked about that. We looked at the, the data um, and that's gonna be one area we, we're, gonna, um, we're gonna hold a public hearing on and we're gonna really make recommendations and work to develop legislation if necessary. So that was interesting. Um, housing discrimination is, a, is an area that, that we care greatly about. And, um, you know, we called in, you know, the Office for Fair Housing and Equity. And we looked at a lot of studies. And um, so, you know, there's still housing discrimination going on in, in, in the city of Boston. So um, we, uh, we are gonna keep working with the Fair Housing and Equi Equity Office. And if we can see, a, a, if there is a real estate company or something, if we can find a pattern of discrimination, 
we are going to we're going to really address that. And and so there's a, the Fair Housing is is redoing a study that was done earlier to see if they can find that, and then we can also take further steps to investigate um, and work on that with the immigrant community. You know, we're really um, going to be looking at opportunities to help do direct outreach to communities in education series so they can know their rights. Um, and we find, we, after talking to many different organizations, a lot of immigrants do not know their rights and they're, they live in a lot of fear. And so we wanna be able to make an impact by educating them. And um, we're also gonna be working with the, um, the mayor's office on women's advancement around um, transgender, transgender issues because um, it, transgender violence in this country is up dramatically and it's underreported and we want to make sure that the city's doing doing its job on that and um, so th those are the areas that that we really um, spent a lot of time we looked at health and inequities in the city of Boston and there's there's a task force working on that and we're open to having meet with them um, so you know we're, it's it's sort of a, a different way of looking at what the Human Rights Commission was and trying to find the best place for us to make our, a, a real difference in lives every day. So um, it's it's been, um, you know, it, it's like I said, it's, a, it's appointed commission. So it's not something like you can strive to be on, but it is a great honor to be on it. And it's sort of um, someone that works in housing. So I've worked at, at uh, Metro Housing Boston. We, we used to be called Metropolitan Boston Housing Partnership. And in 2017, we changed our name to Metro Housing Boston because everybody called us Metro Housing anyways. Um, and so I've been there for uh, 23 and a half years. And uh, so, you know, you, we, we serve uh, Boston and 29 surrounding communities. And um, I've seen firsthand the impact of, of, you know, people searching and searching to find apartments, even with the voucher in their hand and not getting it and landlords denying people. And so it's, it's housing discrimination is really uh, one, of the, one of the things I care passionately about. And being, um, being like a, a you know, in a leader in government um, throughout the pandemic, like obviously that's a very hands-on role that you have. Um, you know, how have you adjusted your leadership style um, get throughout the past year in order to, to be effective in your role? So I think um, certainly in my, in my role as a CFO uh, where I have uh, 10, 10 direct staff reporting to me and in my work on the Human Rights Commission, I, it's all about flexibility and compassion. And people are, are working really hard. They're just doing it in different ways and um, letting, finding a way to have coffee with someone on Zoom and not have it be a burden, but have it be a, a way to connect and to have meaningful conversations and also to do the work. Um, I think Zoom has been, you know, a blessing and a curse. It, 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 you could spend all day on meetings and you get really tired looking at the screen and trying to figure out who am I supposed to be looking at? Who am I supposed, is, are we connecting or, you know, it, are things lost? But it's much better than email where, you know, sometimes email is very, you know, to the point, or you can read things that are not there. So I, I find that um, that finding a way to connect to people, you know, people use Teams, people use all kinds of ways to connect, but just to make sure that that connection is there and that um, acknowledging how hard it is. Most, I have, I have all of my staff are people of color and a lot of them are single moms. So um, to make sure that they're taking the space and the time and, and to let them know it's, it's okay if you don't get back to me now. I mean, I don't know how people are, are 
having their kids go to school remotely and trying to do work. And in a, you know, in accounting and finance, you have to you have to concentrate it. It's in the details. So um and it, the human rights, you know, it, I do more reading than I've ever done. I've read every every book I could get my hands on on diversity and, and uh, equality and racism, anti-racism work. Um, so, and, and it never stops. Like it's really hard to know when when your day begins and when it ends now. And it's been a year. So people, right now, I feel like I need to be extra compassionate with staff because it has been a long year. <laughs> So. That's, that's a very good uh, thing to keep in mind. Passion and flexibility are really, uh, really resonates with me. I'm curious a little bit more about, you know, what does a day look like at, you know, pre-COVID, during COVID, whatever, as the CFO of, of Metro Housing? What, what does that kind of look like? Well, you know, it's... Um, so I was on sabbatical. I took, um, I had been there at, at Metro long enough to have a sabbatical. So I took two months off and I was a volunteer on the Elizabeth Warren campaign. Um, so I came back to work the week we shut down for the pandemic. So I had done a lot of work preparing to be away for two months and then came back and Everybody went home. I had we had hired two new staff people in my department that I met once. Um, so uh, everybody sort of got up to speed. We did a really good job about getting laptops to people and getting them up to speed. But it is um, you know it's it's a lot more time answering emails and getting on Zoom, and then just making sure that all the work is done. And you know most of our, our contracts are you know are reimbursable, so we um, we bill and then we get paid for the work we do. And when you're dealing with millions of dollars and and so billing is very timely, it's a little stressful. And then this the state um, gave us twenty million dollars in October for the for rental relief for people and we had to figure out how to hire staff, get that program up and running and get the money out the door. And at the same time, the city of Boston gave us a contract, city of Revere, uh, Braintree Milton. I mean, a lot of people were looking for a place that had the infrastructure to get COVID relief money to people right away. So it was a lot of long hours and a lot of, um, uh, stress and I, I would go into the I would go into the office three days a week because no one was there and it was just easier for me and then a lot of things still have to actually have my signature on them so um, I, I, I people adjusted really well and um, you know it's it for me it's been a hard year uh, working longer hours and I've never I've never been afraid of hard work I mean I'm I you know I I put in the hours, but you know, there's no weekends, there's no, <laughs> there's no day, there's no night. There's, <laughs> so um, I'm looking forward to things somewhat going back to normal, I hope by the summer, but it's, uh, you know, a, a lot, a lot more meetings with, with other senior staff and in, in trying to figure out what to do and how to address the issues. And we hired um, over 50 people during the pandemic. And that was a challenge um, because we had so much money coming in that we had to get out the door. So we went from 152 people to now we're 200 and something. So, and, and that, that was a challenge too. Just even the paperwork for that was a challenge. Yeah, I'm, I'm hiring one person right now. And I feel like, how can you, how can this happen on Zoom? It's crazy. That's, that's amazing. So I, I have a question, which is, um, so when the commission is looking at human rights, is there uh, a set definition of what constitutes a human right? 
Um, and if so, where did that definition come from? Um, so, like who in Boston said that and, and are the principles that the commission is using, do they align perfectly with your own principles? So I, I think it's not, it's not universally agreed on what counts as a human right. Some people think housing counts, some people think healthcare counts, other people's don't. So I, I would just like to kind of hear the different, different standards that you work with. So we came up with a new mission statement. So our mission statement is, our mission is to pr promote the human rights of all people in the city of Boston. We aim to enforce human rights, to engage in relationships and partnerships that embody the principles of dignity and respect, and to create a culture of human rights compliance and accountability. We act as a driver for social change based on the principles of substantive equality, equity, and inclusion for all people. We accomplish our mission by exposing, challenging, and ending entrenched and widespread structures and systems of discrimination through education, policy development, public inquiries, and investigations. So I don't know if that answers your question or not, but I guess um, for, you know, certainly knowing uh, the city of Boston and, and Mayor Walsh and, um, you know, housing is a human right, um, you know, uh, every, I think, it, um, I think the dignity and respect can, can really capture a lot of things because if you really respect someone and you want that person to have dignity, then they won't be discriminated for housing, for jobs, for, uh, you know, we, you know, we found in the, um, we want to make sure that ICE doesn't come into the Boston public schools and take out kids because we feel like that is not respecting their human rights to be educated, that education should be a human right. So I think the values that my personal values um, are reflected in all the other commissioners and all the work that, that we want to do. So when you talk about discrimination, are you are you specifically focusing on discrimination of uh, federally or state pr protected classes, or are you talking about any kind of discrimination? So there, there is a um, Boston has its own office of discrimination. So you know we we're, we're looking at I guess systemic discrimination, patterns of discrimination. So whether, you know, HUD has, you know, its own discrimination. So if it's housing discrimination, if it's just one person that's being discriminated against, they would go to the Office of Fair Housing. But if that we, but looking at those cases, if we see that it's a real estate company or, um, you know, somebody, an entity that's doing the discrimination and we, and we can see a pattern of it, then we would look at that. So, you know, I, you know, luckily we live in Massachusetts and the, the state laws around discrimination in protected classes are very, you know, they sort of encompass, uh, you know, it's, it's, they encompass LGBTQ people, they, you know, people of color, women, age. I mean, we have a lot of laws and areas we can look at. So, it, you know, we're, I think that, um, I think we, we sort of know where people can be discriminated and what for, so. Yeah. I don't know if that answers your question. really an interesting um it's an interesting topic and thinking in our current you know world what a human right to some person might be you know expected and understood and what someone else might think would not you know would not constitute as a human right would be something you know more political in nature or, or whatever that might be um and defining that in certain arenas can be really difficult, I find. So it's definitely an interesting question. Mm -hmm. Is there an example, Audra, that you were kind of thinking of as something specific? Well, 
Um, so for example, when I read the New York Times, I'll read an article about um, homelessness and then you know, in, 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 New York, in New York City, my understanding is that every, anybody who's homeless has a, a, a guaranteed right to housing, but that's not true in other cities. So New York has a very complex, large homeless shelter system, which isn't necessarily true in other cities. And so then it, it appears that in New York City home, you know, housing is a human right, but in other cities, it might not be. So that's where I was sort of saying Boston may have a very specific set of what they consider to be a human right. And I thought, you know, it'd be very interesting to hear those enumerated and then and then just sort of hear your opinion on it. And it's the same thing with healthcare, right? Healthcare is not a human right in the United States, but morally, you may think it is. So Massachusetts is one of the only states that uh, you have a right to shelter. So um, if, if you're in Massachusetts and you're homeless, uh, you, have, you have the right to shelter. So that's, uh, uh, you, um, there, you know, there's a shelter system that the Department of Housing and Community Development operates. So the, the housing is a right. And then, you know, we had, you know, we had what's now Mass Connect Healthcare uh, before, before, you know, the Affordable Care Act in Massachusetts. So um, I think on, on those respects, Massachusetts tries, I mean, we're not perfect by any means, but as a state, we try to guarantee housing and, and health care to people. Until there's a federal system, it, it won't be perfect for, I think, for many things, but um, we try, you know, and, you know, un unfortunately, um, HUD hasn't put a lot of money into building housing in a very, very long time. Uh, so it's really hard to get uh, permanent housing built for people that's affordable, but there certainly is a, a shelter system in place. Uh, now it's called um, home base uh, where, where people, and if the shelters are full, you get placed in a motel. And uh, where I work, we actually have a program where we try to um, work with people that, you know, at one point in time, there were like 3000 families living in motels in Massachusetts through the shelter system. And that number has gone down significantly. Um, th there's very few families right now living in shelter. Hopefully that will stay that way. And, you know, the effects of this pandemic, we won't know for a long time where the jobs come back. People are hanging on, you know, by their fingernails and, and you know, that we might see after, after the pandemic, after, you know, people are vaccinated and that goes away, it's going to take a while for us to recover. And then you might see a lot more people becoming homeless, being evicted. Um, right now there's an eviction moratorium and there's a lot of money helping people stay where they are. But how long, how long can that last? You, you know, you can't pay somebody's rent for two years in, in a, you know, it, it's going to be really interesting what happens and how, how we change our social services to adapt to uh, post pandemic and for how long that period lasts. You know, a lot of people were working, you know, two and three jobs just to afford the rent that they have, and then they lost those jobs, or maybe they still have one. And these are frontline people that were mostly people of color that were impacted the most by the pandemic. Yeah, absolutely. I feel uh, grateful to live in Massachusetts where, um, where human rights and, and health care and housing and all of those things uh, are, you know, almost a given that they fall under the human rights category. And um, when I talk to, I have a lot of friends in other junior leagues, um, and I talk to them about what's going on in their cities, what's going on in their states. And um, like you said, Audra, that's, it's not the case, you know, that, that other people, we take it for granted sometimes that, that that would be considered a human right, um, and that we should all be advocating um, for human rights. Uh, so I totally hear that. That's, that's a very interesting thing to think about.
I'm curious in terms of, you know, your work um, in housing, I feel like it's, it's kind of the number one human right. How can you do anything without a protection, shelter, a roof over your head, um, all of that? In the city of Boston, are there things that you feel like are, are really working about this system and things that are really broken um, that need to be addressed or that you guys are working on addressing, but still a lot of work to be done? Um, so, you know, um, as you know, Boston went through this big development boom. And um, I think Mayor Walsh did a, a fairly good job on, on building more housing, but there's just not enough housing, um, not enough housing for low, low income people. And most developments, uh, you know, that went up were, um, were luxury housing, you know, and so I, I really think that there is a need to build more affordable housing and to do it in a way that is uh, inclusive and not, we don't need to build any more housing projects where we just put, okay, all the poor people here, they're all gonna be in this project. We really have to uh, do a bit better job at having affordable housing in anything that we build. And, you know, there are, you know, there are requirements uh, right now where you build so much, but you can, developers can opt out and put that money aside and that say, okay, then that money will go and that housing will get built somewhere else. But we have to do a better job at, at trying to integrate our communities, not, not by color, but also by social economic status, because, you know, we have to really start living together. And if you look at Boston, you know, we're not in places like where I live, Jamaica Plain, it's been gentrified and a lot of um, people of color have had to move out because they could not afford it. So I think we have to really do a better job about when we, when housing gets built, the developments get built, that we do something so that it, it hits all the strata and, and anybody can live there. It's, we just don't have enough housing in, 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 you know, it's, you know, in some ways you can't build yourself out of this problem, but some ways you have to, and you just have to, um, you know, you have to look at things differently and, you know, it's, it's great to have, you know, luxury housing towers going up, but, you know, who can afford to live there? And now what happens in that, like, and what happens when we get back to work? Can some of the, uh, all the office buildings that we have, what happens to those? Can some of those be partially converted to housing if people are gonna work remotely? I mean, I think people really have to look and think outside of wh what has been and, and what's possible. I feel like that um, the concept of of being living together, living beyond just where where you can afford the, the idea of affordable housing, all being in one location and and not um, sort of you know for lack of a better word or maybe for the right word integrating into um, communities so that there is a variety of housing available everywhere could have so many positive ramifications in education and and all sorts of other or realms, is there a selling point that you would use to kind of convince people of that to, to say, you know, I, so often, right? It's like, well, don't build that in my neighborhood. You know, that's kind of an old fashioned, I don't want that going up X, you know, what is that gonna do to my property value? You, these kinds of things, how, how would you communicate that? I think, you know, it, it's really, it's a, it's a struggle. It's a struggle here in, in Jamaica Plain where, you know, we're, we, you know, we're so groovy and cool and progressive in JP, right. but we, you know, there are neighborhoods that push back because they don't want more housing development. They, they see the neighborhood changing and they don't want it to happen. And I think, you know, one of the, one of the keys I think is to educate people. If you have the time, you should, I highly recommend people read the book, The Color of Law, because it talks about housing discrimination and how it came apart and how, you know, HUD 
in all the banks, they were allowed to discriminate. And, and, and you can look and you can see the impact in major cities, especially in Boston, of where low income and people of color live and, and how, you know, they're, you know, they live, you know, this, you know, their environment where they live, you know, the, that impact in, in how they've been sort of segregated out and they could not buy housing anywhere else or, you know, it's, it's really a, a fascinating study on systemic racism through housing and, um, and how the only way that we are going to change that is if we have proactive policies that reverse that. And, you know, Senator Warren has been, you know, she's written books on, you know, all of her books sort of touch on that aspect. But we really have to, you know, systemic racism in this country was done through policies and legislation. That's that's how it, it got to be systemic. And the only way you undo those things is through policies and legislation. So, you know, and, you know, and I think that the more people understand and know the history, if they're willing to be open to that, they can they can see it. It's sort of the same thing with voting rights. There's a great book um, called "Give Us the Ballot" that talks about the history of voting rights. And you know, you you read these books and then you understand it, and and it just changes the whole way you look at things. It changes the way I look at when I drive around. You know. The city and how the suburbs didn't have to have you know people of color in them because they just made it so that a person of color couldn't buy a house <laughs> in the suburbs. I mean, it's it's pretty astonishing, um, and so it it is hard though to to convince people to uh, want to have de more development in their neighborhood, even even if it's um, we're just having a fight in JP over. Uh, a development that's going to be for elderly housing and people didn't want it. Oh, it can't be, you know, five stories high and they had all these, but this is elderly housing, which is so needed, um, you know, in Boston because, you know, the, you know, HUD stopped building elderly housing too. So, you know, it's, it's especially, um, I feel, you know, where they have, what happens in government, it, 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 everybody's fighting over the same piece of the pie. Like if you, it's, there's, there's so much money in social services and every group rightly want, they, you know, there's, there's, you know, food insecurity, there's, it's, all of that stuff is so interconnected. And, and how do you make sure that we're spending our money on uh, ways that, that address all those issues. And so for me, housing, if, if you don't have a safe place to live, then, you know, how do your kids go to school and, and, and be able to, you know, be educated, do their homework, come home at night? Um, you know, how do you have a job if you, don't, if you don't have a bed to sleep in? I mean, so for me, housing is the, is the underlying issue. So what do you, I mean, what do you see as the, the best funding mechanism for creating more affordable housing? I mean, there's building it, then also just sort of property maintenance. So, you know, in my, my pie in the sky thing that it would be, it would be a government um, private enterprise. I mean, if you look at uh, Walmart, McDonald's, I mean, you know, we're, we're paying, I don't know if, uh, we're, we're paying out in, in food stamps in other ways because people are not getting just wages where they live. So there should be more workforce housing built. Uh, and I think that, you know, if you've got, so you get an Amazon and they have all these people and they're paying and they're not paying them enough to live in that city, well then they should be helping to build housing for those people. So uh, you know that's that's the perfect world is that that everybody would want their workers to have have decent housing. And it would also drive down the cost. The more, you know, the more it's it's you know it's supply and demand in Boston for a long time. There just wasn't enough housing and you know you have 
you're renting out, you're going to rent an apartment to 15 students that can give you $3,000 or can you, do you rent it to a family of four that can't pay that much money? So, you know, part of it was supply and demand. The colleges in Boston were not and still aren't building dorms. So it's like, it's, it's everything. You have to have enough student housing. You have to have enough workforce housing, have enough elderly and disabled housing. So I think everybody has to, um, has to pay. I mean, it's in, you know, look, one of the things that um, th there are plenty of tax breaks for corporations. So there's new market tax credits where uh, a corporation can get, you know, big discounts off their taxes if they give so much to somebody that's that's buying something in a low, low income housing place and they're showing a community benefit. Well, why bother give those tax breaks? Why, why don't you just tax the corporations at the amount they should be taxed at? Take that money and put it into the communities that need it most, whether they need it for housing or infrastructure. But, it, you know, this, we have it set up so that corporations get huge tax breaks, they don't pay their fair taxes, and then cities and towns and Relig religions and everybody has to come up with the money to help have food banks and all this stuff. It's, it's really, it's, we're, we're just looking at it upside down. It's, it, it, to me, uh, revenue is, uh, it's, it's there if we go about taxing it properly and then using that money to build what we need. It's not like we're a poor country. I mean, you know, <laughs> Don't get me started on defense spending. I mean, you know, <laughs> we have the money. We're just not spending it in the right way. And we, we, you know, we we tax we tax people. Like, why does Bank of America pay no taxes when Bank of America was, you know, really responsible for uh, not giving loans to people of color? They just they had it that they would not give loans to, you know, mortgages to black people. I mean, it's just ridiculous. They get, I feel like a lot of corporations get rewarded for bad behavior. I put that book in the chat as well, um, The Color of Law. Um, it's dense, I'm warning you. <laughs> yes. You went to DC so you can handle it. I can handle it. I, <laughs> and I have read, um, certainly read, some articles recently, you know, about redlining, and it really does put into perspective, uh, you know, how Boston is shaped currently. Um, I live in Mattapan, actually, um, and but I've lived in Beacon Hill, I've lived in South Boston, um, and I work um, in a lot of um, communities around the city, you know, majority white affluent areas. Um, and it is, it's very clear cut, you know, you just, you can see it when you drive, you know, one from one street to another. So um, learning about it has been, you know, both fascinating and horrifying, but, but really understanding, I was ne never taught to me before. Um, mm -hmm. And you kind of think of the inequity of housing as this big, giant thing, but when you kind of break down the history, it, it and it makes a lot more sense um, how we got to where we are today. I also, just to plug um, for the Junior League, I put in three mothers um, in the chat as well, which is our upcoming diversity, equity, and inclusion book for our um, reading club. Um, I put them both from Frugal Bookstore in the chat, and I just recently purchased something from them and um, it was like ready within a day. It's a black owned um, bookstore, local bookstore in, uh, I think, West Roxbury. So, uh, or Roxbury, I can't remember. Um, I mean, it's in Nubian Square, I think. Yeah. It's in Nubian Square. There you go. Neither of those. <laughs> but the, uh, the, the links are there. So um, I would recommend anybody that's on the call and anybody listening from the Junior League when, uh, when this goes out. 
to the rest of our um, members that they should check out both of those books and also um, definitely check out our, our Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Book Club for sure. We're already at 721. I can't believe it. We've passed our, our 45 minutes, <laughs> but I want to make sure um, if anybody has any other questions before we hop off tonight, um, I'm so grateful for the conversation that we've had. So I, you know, I encourage any other questions if they, if they are out there. Well, my question is um, for people who are interested in working more in this area, um, is there what, like what sort of organizations or what paths would you um, see as possible venues? So in housing or human rights or? Let's just say generally human rights. So I, I think, you know, there are a lot of um, nonprofits out there in the city of Boston has, has a plethora of nonprofits. So I would, I would ask people to think about what, what part of human rights they're passionate about. And if it's housing or homelessness, or, uh, you know, they're, they're like, there's Pine Street Inn, there's Rosie's Place, there's, uh, you know, the Woman's Lunch Place. For housing, uh, Metro Housing, we are always hiring people. We get people that, that uh, a lot of people come and they work for us for a year or two and then they go off to grad school and do great things. Um, if they're, you know, interested in, um, trying to think of particular issues, I, th I think that, I guess what people are passionate about, I think no matter what industry or what field they go in, they can make a, they can make a difference when it comes to human rights. And, and for me, volunteering in politics ha has had a really, uh, really strong impact. So if you find a candidate that is uh, progressive and shares your values and your ideas that you believe about, I would encourage you uh, you know, volunteering for that campaign. I mean, that's, you know, I met Ayanna Presley when she was thinking about running for Boston City Council. And I've been with her every step of the way. And it's been amazing because I, that's someone that has really made a difference in the policies and impact of the city of Boston. Sex education wasn't taught in the city of Boston at the time that Ayanna was first elected to city council. And she changed that. I mean, they're, they're, you know, you, you really make differences, as I said before, it's systemic changes by changing policies. And the way that you do that is in this, you know, country, basically mostly through laws and legislation. So, um, you know, find a candidate that you're passionate about, find, you know, an issue that you're passionate about and see where you can put yourself to work. And it doesn't matter, you know, where you are, who you are, I, I feel like everybody can make a difference. Awesome. That's a great place to, to kind of recap. I think um, certainly uh, in our work at the Junior League of Boston, um, you know, we hope to uphold the values of, you know, the Human Rights Commission as well. And, and um, I know through our advocacy work where we're working with food insecurity and the Crown Act Coalition um, and domestic violence, you know, abuse victims and all of that. I hope that we can kind of continue to align and, and support um, the city's efforts um, through our work as well, for sure. Well, thank you for having me. I, I um, sorry, I didn't have like prepared hard facts, but um, no, no, a great conversation. No, this was, this was perfect. I, I'm really grateful for your time and really grateful that you were willing to kind of share your story with us. It's very inspiring um, and to hear how much you kind of, uh, how much adversity you faced and, and kind of broken through and, and continued to just make a, make a better Boston um, through, through both your work um, at Metro Housing and, and in the city. Um, so it's, it's great. Well, thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you.
Yes. All right. Well, um, I'll send an email um, just out um, to recap and with the uh, recording once it's out. And um, thank you again. Thank you for your time. This was a wonderful evening. Okay. Good night. Be safe. Bye. Bye. You too. Stay warm. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. <laughs> Bye.